How'd I do? Oh, sweet 10 minutes of prayer. Open your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 8. Last week we looked at uh, a little bit the story of Jesus healing a man with leprosy. And I'm going to read it again just for a little bit of context because I want to finish up something there that I think I left hanging. Now we're going to look at this, the Roman centurion. So the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 8. As you're getting there, I'll remind you he had just finished giving his Sermon on the Mount. That he marveled the people that he was teaching that were gathered around him because they said this man speaks as one with authority. He doesn't cite the teachers of the day. He's not quoting a, a specific rabbinic school. He speaks as one who has authority. And that authority is what we're going to talk about. So these, the Sermon on the Mount was his authoritative words. And Matthew chapter 8 and 9, we get to look at his authoritative works. So Matthew chapter 8, beginning the reading at verse 1, it says, When he came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hands and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately he was cured of his leprosy, and Jesus said to him, See that you don't tell anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them. When Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, asking for help. Lord, he said, My servant lies at home paralyzed and in terrible suffering. Jesus said to him, I will go and heal him. The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one go and he goes and that one come and he comes. I say to my servant, do this and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was astonished and said to those around those following him, I tell you the truth, I've not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their place at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go, it will be done just as you believed it, believed it would. And the, his servant was healed at that very hour. I'm telling you. This one, I've been excited to preach this one. And I've been doing mental reps on it all week. That's, uh, that's like pastor code for praying through the text. Um, but I need to start at verse, uh, verses 3 and 4 with the leper again. <clears throat> so one of, the, one of the teachings in the Sermon on the Mount, the authoritative teachings that Jesus gave, was that he didn't come to abolish the law. He didn't come to get rid of it and set it aside. He came to fulfill it and bring it to completion. And that authoritative teaching... Because that was something that the, the Jews were worried about, that this guy is coming with a new teaching and now our old way of life is completely gone because he's going to do away with it. No, he says, I'm going, to make, I'm going to do through the law what it couldn't do. I'm going to make you uh, righteous because you have to be more righteous than the religious people if you want to get into the kingdom. So this man comes with leprosy before Jesus and he's literally a dead man walking. That's how he was regarded. The historian Josephus wrote around the first century here, first, second century, sometime in there. He said when a man was diagnosed with leprosy, it was as if he were already dead. He's a zombie. He's a dead man walking. They're waiting for the sentence to be carried out. In the Middle Ages, so you fast forward 1,500 years, 1,400, 1,500 years, when a man was diagnosed with leprosy, the priest would don his stole, grab his crucifix, walk to the man, and pronounce the burial rites over him. It was a hopeless scenario. He was a dead man walking. This leper comes before Jesus, and he says, if you're willing, heal me. Jesus heals him. Jesus touches the dead man. Now, this is the cool thing that... There are 61 touches in the Old Testament which will make a man ceremonially unclean. 61 touches. The number is not significant. What is significant is that leprosy is the number two uh, defiling touch only to a corpse. So an actual corpse and a living corpse, a corpse to be, are the two most defiling touches in the Old Testament. At, in Luke chapter 7, Jesus is going to touch a dead body and raise him up to life. And here in Matthew 8, he touches a living dead man and he brings him and restores him. And when he does, he says, now, go to the priest in the temple 
and make the sacrifice that Moses offered. See, in Leviticus 14, there was a provision, an allowance made for the miraculous healing of leprosy. There was a required sacrifice that you would make. Take a couple of doves, kill one under rutting water, sprinkle the one, the living with the blood, and there's hyssop involved, and there's cedar wood. It was a complex ritual. And then you let the, li- the one dove you didn't kill go away, and this will be the, the, this is the law of the Lord in the day of the leper's cleansing. And he says, now, because I didn't come to get rid of it, you still have to do this because the law says when you are miraculously cured of your leprosy, you go do this. So he, to fulfill the law, not to get rid of it, sends him to the priest so that he can make the sacrifice in accordance with the law of Moses. And when he gets there, you're like, so what, right? When he gets there, the dead man, the formerly dead man, goes to the temple completely healed, restored, not just physically, but now to society. He walked, they would have known him as a dead man, and now the one who was formerly dead stands before them, alive and cleansed and whole. They can't look at this guy anymore and say, you don't belong here. Because what Jesus has done in his physical life gives him every right to be there as much as any one person. And that's what it's like for all of us. We don't have any right on our own to stand before God. We live our lives in sin and rebellion, and we live outside of the camp, as it were, just like the leper. But because of what Jesus has done, what he pronounced over our life, healing and cleansing from the sin that we carried with us, because of faith in him, we can stand now before him alive and whole, more alive than we had ever been. We were dead men walking, now we have every right to be there as alive in Christ. And that's what Jesus did for this leper. He fulfilled the very law. And now, none of us have to kill two doves and under running water and sprinkle them with the blood of the other. And it's all because of what he has done. And he did it then. Ready for your mind to be blown? He did it 2,000 years ago. And the work that he did, the blood that he shed, is effective today. Right? We believe in faith that what he did then somehow counts for us today so that we can look back to a finished work and we can receive the blessing today. This is a beautiful picture. It is a beautiful reality of what God has done in all of our lives. And the reason that I preach the gospel just about every single Sunday I stand up here is because I need the gospel every single day. I need to be reminded what God has done in my life. I need to know that in my flesh I'm a dead man walking. But through what Christ has done and the blood that he's shed for me, I am alive today because I am alive and free because it's for freedom that Christ has set me free. I, I am going to be a master of something. I'm either going to be a master or be mastered by sin or I'm going to be, have Christ as my master. I'm going to be mastered by something. I'd rather be my savior than sin. So I preach the gospel because I need to hear the gospel. And I preach the gospel because I'm sure someone out here needs to hear the gospel. It is the only power that any man is going to be saved by. The good news is what will set you free. So we go on. After that, so Jesus is coming down from the mountain when he meets the leper. Somewhere between the the mountainside where he preaches and the gates of the city, he meets the leper. Now he goes into Capernaum. Capernaum is on the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee. Apparently, from what I've read, it is a picturesque, beautiful kind of coastal town. It's not, it gets a little hot, okay? But he he can deal. Uh, It is beautiful. Jesus I don't imagine, he talks about being homeless, right? Foxes have uh, holes, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He headquartered himself here, but he didn't live here. But I suppose if you're going to have a headquarters, you might as well have a little bit of creature comforts, at least it's pretty to look at. He does more miracles in Capernaum than anywhere else in his earthly ministry. And in a couple chapters, he's going to go, but woe to you, Capernaum. Bethsaida and Chorazin. If the miracles that had been done in you were done in Tyre and Sidon or Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented. But now, because you've rejected me, when instead of being lifted up to heaven, you will be cast down into the depths. You see, just because they, you saw a miracle or because you were close to Jesus physically doesn't mean that you have faith in him to save you. He's in Capernaum, and as he's in town, now a centurion comes up to him. So before, this was a Jewish guy, because he goes to the temple to offer sacrifices. A Jewish guy who lived outside of the camp, has a disease that is incurable, he's a dead man walking, and Jesus meets him. Now, coming inside, 
the city a centurion who's a Roman soldier, okay? Roman soldier is, means not a Jew, not part of the covenant people of God. The Jew was outside the camp. The centurion is outside of the covenant. He has no reason to come to Jesus. None at all. And when he comes, he comes with the same level of admiration and honor that the leper did. He calls him Lord. This Gentile commander of a hundred Roman soldiers, that's where centurion, century, he commands a hundred soldiers. He comes to him as a Gentile and he stands before him pleading for help and he addresses him as Lord. We read through the Scriptures, and sometimes because we know Jesus is Lord, we just kind of gloss over these things. But when you put this in its context, for a Gentile soldier who is a representative of the occupying force over the region, like Rome controls everything, Caesar, generals, centurion, the, the, the uh, complete authority that Caesar has is delegated to this soldier. That soldiers aren't looked at favorably by the Jews. But this one, I don't know if it's the living around the Jews. I don't know if it's the knowing what Jesus has done, heard him teach. There's something about him that when he sees Jesus, he can address him with a title, Kurios, Lord. And it is, it's an honorable title. It, it's one that can shows, um, uh, conveys ownership, right? It's a master, Lord, uh, Lord, servant relationship. And it shows that in this hierarchy, Jesus is over the Roman authority. When in the reality, the world, it's the other way around. If the, if the soldier were to tell Jesus to do something, he's expected to do it because the centurion is the one with the authority. And the authority is a big piece here as we go through. So he says, he says I recognize Jesus that you are over me, that you actually have a decision-making power in terms of what I do, what I can do. He says, because of that, I'm asking you for help. He goes, I have this servant at home, and he lies paralyzed. He's suffering in severe pain, some translations say. The word here in the Greek is not doulos. Like uh, a lot of times in the New Testament, someone will say, uh, uh, you know, uh, James, he introduces his letter. James, Bond servant of Jesus Christ or slave of Jesus Christ. That is, that is due loss. The word here that he uses is pais. And it means servant, not slave, but servant. Sometimes it means child. And some commentators have, have uh, tried to say that, uh, that it should be translated child. Like maybe the centurion had an illegitimate relationship and this child is actually his and it was with a Jewish person and that's why he comes to Jesus. I think that's a little bit of a stretch. I think that's reading too much into it. I think the word here though is ambiguous, ambiguous enough to show the kind of care that this centurion had for his servant inside his house. That he wasn't an overbearing taskmaster, but he was someone who had compassion. See, it was the compassion of Jesus to be able to act for the leper that led him to do it. And here, it's the compassionate nature, the compassionate heart of the centurion for his servant that he brings him to Jesus. It's one thing to just feel bad for someone, to try to empathize with their pain. But the centurion knew there was something he could do, and he could go to the Lord. Now, this was wildly uncommon during this time period, because the... the um, the way servants were regarded was that they were tools to be used in the fulfillment of a task. And when the usefulness was done, the servant was expired, expelled, or just left to die. Right? There wasn't, a, there wasn't a, a grand concern for human life because to them, he wasn't a human. He was just a tool utilitarian in nature. There wasn't any dignity. But to, say, to call him a pais, my servant, it shows something about the heart of the centurion. He shows compassion, and he brings him to Jesus. And Jesus says to him, after, as he's pleading, Lord, he's suffering. He's in severe pain and paralyzed. And Jesus says to him, uh, shall I come and heal him? 
You would think it'd be like a, like, it's a rhetorical question. Shall I come and heal him? No, that, I mean, that's why you came. And you would expect them to go, yes, I live just down the street, around the corner, one block over. But the centurion's response is just kind of crazy to me. He says, I don't, Lord, again with the Lord, kurios, one over me, right? One with decision-making power in my life. Lord, I don't deserve to have you come under my roof. How do we want to start this? Jesus offers the healing by going there. And the centurion refuses because he's not worthy to have them. So up to this point, the miracles that Jesus done, they've all had a proximity to them. A touch, like the leper, he reached out and touched him. Some miracles, Jesus uh, would spit and make mud, rub it in the guy's eyes. Doesn't seem like a very good way to heal somebody. I've never had a doctor do that to me, but Jesus did it, so we're going to say it's okay, right? Um, someone reached out and touched the hem of his garment. There was a touch. But it, when the, the paralyzed guy came down through the roof, when his four friends lowered him through the mat, there was at least proximity. The servant or the centurion recognizes something about Jesus, that there doesn't even have to be proximity anymore, that Jesus, through a word, can heal from a distance. This is unheard of. This is not how these things go. If you're going to bring someone to a healer, you're going to bring them to a healer. The servant is at home, lying in bed, paralyzed and in severe pain, and it was bringing bringing the need to Jesus. In great faith is what Jesus would say. In his ability to do it at his word from a distance. There's a a recognition then, as twice now he's called him Lord, when the Bible repeats itself, pay attention to it. There's a recognition of his lordship, of his position in the life of the centurion. But there's also a recognition. He says, I don't deserve to have you come here. Again, flip things around because it would not, it's not that he doesn't deserve to have Jesus in his house. It would be improper for Jesus to go to his house. He's a Gentile. They eat pigs in that house. They, they, They eat lobster and shellfish and other unclean foods. It's not proper for Jesus to go there according to Jewish law. But the centurion says, I don't deserve to have you come to my house. I wonder if anyone in here has ever felt like they don't deserve to have Jesus come to them, into their life, into their heart. I have. When I got saved, I felt horrible, like a wretch of a son because of how I felt about my father. And I was, as I hated my earthly father because what he did to me, I was being told that there's a heavenly father that loves me despite that. Like, look, my track record, track record with loving dads, love, love towards dads, is not good, yet you want to come into my life? I'm not worthy. I don't deserve to have you here. I listened to a man. I told you about him last week. His name's Billy. He says, I deserve a millstone for the things that I've done. And all you have to do is read the scriptures to put that in context. He goes, I don't deserve to have the Lord come into my life because I deserve a millstone and he wants to give me a robe of righteousness. I deserve judgment and condemnation and he's given me a pardon and grace. I don't deserve it. And the the centurion recognized this. I don't deserve you, Jesus. Lord, someone in my life who I can not just look up to but place myself under the authority of trusting that with the decision-making power that you have in my life, that you're not going to lead me astray. He goes, all you have to do is say it, right? And this isn't a speak a thing into existence, right? This is the centurion recognizing the authority of Jesus because the way it goes in a, in a command structure, right? In a, um, in a rank and file there's a chain of command. Caesar's at the top, and he delegates his authority to a general, and a general will delegate his authority to the centurion. And the centurions were known as the backbone of the Roman army. And he says, in the same way that I have an authority delegated to me, and then I tell, other, I tell people, go, and he goes, he recognized the same authority in Jesus' life, that he operates under the authority of a father in heaven, under a power greater than him. Jesus would testify, I don't, I don't say anything that my father doesn't tell me to say. 
Right? Jesus is getting his marching orders from the top. And then he tells it as it comes down from the Father. The centurion recognizes this in Jesus' life. And he says, in the same way that I command my servants to go, and he goes, and this one come, and he comes, or do this, and it gets done, you can command paralysis and pain. Wrap your mind around that. This morning, 6.53, Lily gets out of bed. She, she shouldn't be out of bed any time before 7, because I got... I'm praying over the text, and I'm praying for you guys. I'm getting ready to preach. And here she comes. Hey, Daddy. And she could tell by the look on her face that I was not pleased to see her at 6.53 this morning. Right? And here I am. I'm, I'm in the middle of authority, and I'm thinking, I have authority as the father in this household. Go back to bed. And she goes, I don't want to, Daddy. There's a thing about authority is that the person who you're giving the command to has to recognize they're under your authority and then receive the command and they have to obey it. She didn't obey because she didn't want to. When Jesus, who has authority over paralysis and pain, tells the pain to go away, the the pain doesn't get to go... It listens. In the same way that a subject under, that a soldier under a centurion has to listen when he says go, or he's going to be punished and court-martialed, right? Kicked out of service. If he doesn't listen to the command, the pain doesn't have the option to not listen to Jesus. And the centurion recognized this. The level of authority of person over person was commensurate with Jesus' authority over pain and paralysis. He says, You don't need to come to my house. You can just say it, and it will be done. And Jesus says, I haven't found this kind of faith even in the covenant people of God. This man's not a Jew. He may never even read the Pentateuch. He doesn't know the first five books of the Bible. He doesn't have... What he has is Jesus, a man under authority. And in him, he recognizes something different. And Jesus is amazed. The Greek word there means marveled. And imagine what you have to do to make Jesus go, wow. He's used to making people go, wow, right? So you know the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins. I'll tell this man, get up, take him out, and go home. And then watch this guy stroll, throw his carpet up over his shoulder, and walk right out of the house. Right? Hey, Jesus, they've been with us three days. They're they're really hungry. All right, let's feed them. Tens of thousands, right? This is better than Grubhub. Because loaves and fish turn into multitudes, and everyone was satisfied. Right? Jesus is used to making the crowds go wow. But he meets this guy, and Jesus is like, you got to be kidding me. I've been walking around these people, teaching them, doing miracles, and I have not seen the kind of faith amongst the people. That's who he came for was the Jews. Don't you know he said to the Syrophoenician woman, I have come first to the lost sheep of Israel. He goes, those folks, the ones that I came to, the ones that the Scriptures that they've been steeped in since birth, everywhere they go, they're supposed to be talking about it, meditating on it, teaching it to their kids. When they go to the synagogue, they're going to hear the scrolls read. I'm the one that this whole thing points to. When the fullness of time has come, it says in Galatians, God sent His Son born of a woman born under the law to redeem those under the law. I'm that guy! And they don't get it. He goes, but this guy, the guy who's outside of the covenant people of the Lord, he gets it. He made Jesus marvel because of His faith. Because he believed that Jesus could do it. That he could command pain to go away. We're going to get, we're going to talk more about that command here in a moment. He goes from not being worthy to come into his house to making Jesus amazed. And this, dude, right after, you, dude is a term of endearment and affection for me. Okay, you're all dudes. It's gender neutral. In Matthew 6, during the Sermon on the Mount, 
when Jesus is teaching the disciples and those who are gathered around to hear him, he talks about don't worry, right? Don't worry about what you eat, what you'll drink, what you'll wear, what kind of clothes, how they look. He says that he takes care of the grass of the field, and if they're arrayed in such splendor, why do you worry about what you're going to wear? And then he drops his hammer on him and goes, oh, you of little faith. And he says it multiple times to the disciples throughout the Gospels. Oh, you have little faith. Don't you get it yet? Don't you get it yet? But yet here's the centurion being praised for his great faith. I haven't found it anywhere in Israel. He marveled at it. Almost a sense of, uh, the, the word in the Greek almost has a sense of admiration. It impressed Jesus. So he heard this. He says, he says to those who are following him, now, this is really cool, and it helps for me to, to look at it in the actual scriptures rather than on my notes, because up to this, the dialogue is going 100% towards Jesus. The centurion is talking to him, except for when Jesus says, should I come and heal him, right? And he says, no, 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 you don't, you don't got to do that. I'm not worthy. It's kind of cool in Acts 10, later on, Jesus is going to He's going to kind of take Peter to task a little bit. He's like, I don't need any unclean things. And Jesus says a couple of times, rise up, kill and eat, right? And he's like, Peter's like, no, 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 no. And Jesus is like, look, Peter, don't call anything unclean that I've made clean, right? You can almost see this like foreshadowed here. Listen, don't say your house is unclean, that I don't deserve to be there. If I've cleansed it, it's clean. You know, who the Son has made clean, he is clean indeed. That's how it goes in this, you know, up in this piece. And so here at verse 10, the dialogue shifts, and now Jesus is the one doing the talking. And I, I do it in here because it's in the red letters in my Bible. And he says, when Jesus heard this, he was astonished, and he said to those following him. So now he's not talking to the, gen, the, the Gentile centurion. He's talking to the to the people following him. So, I'm just going to call it what it is. These are Christ followers. They are following the Christ. What's happening here is there's an element of discipleship going on where Jesus is now teaching the people. It's like sidebar, right? Hey, come heal my servant. Pause, right? Hey, what's happening over here? I've never seen amongst you people. Right? There's this an element of disciples thing because he says to those who are following him, this never happens this way. And then he, <laughs> Jesus kind of, like, it's like A, it's like point one and A. He takes this opportunity then to teach them something. Verse 11, I say to you that many will come from, the, he's giving them a lesson on heaven, all right? He stops a healing miracle. And he gives them a lesson on eternal things. Like, Jesus jumps right into eschatology. Right? This is what it's going to be like at the end. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But, man, but is a big word in the Bible. A huge word. It's like, <laughs> baby got Bible, right? I like big butts. There are big buts in the Bible, and this is one of them. If you got that reference, you need Jesus. <laughs> it's an oldie. You'll find it on classic rap. You don't even know what that is. Okay. I keep... But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What Jesus is telling those who are following him, the Jews and the multitudes who have followed him from outside, from the hillside, across the plain, into the city, is that you think just because you're part of the covenant people of God that you're somehow automatically in. He goes, there's going to be many. Now this tells me something about the population of heaven. Many are going to come from the east and the west. Right? What that means is from a distance, from outside of the city, outside of the camp, outside of the covenant people. Many will come. And this is based on imagery from Isaiah 25 and Isaiah 65 about the kingdom age, about what it's going to look like at the great banquet uh, when, uh, in the kingdom when all God's people are going to come together and have the best foods and the greatest wine and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are going to be together and you're going to get a chance to sit down with, with Abraham, you know, like at dinner and be like, hey, 
what was it like to be an old guy and to hear that, like, you're going to have a kid? Like, that had to be pretty crazy, right? Like, this, th- this is what the Jews are expecting, but they're expecting to get there by virtue of birthright. And Jesus is like, newsflash, not how it works. Many will come, many, not a few from outside of here. There's going to be a lot of people. Here's the, here's the thing about heaven. There's going to be a lot of people there when we get there. They're going to be like, seriously? Like, you made it? Did not see that coming. And then there's going to be people that will be like, hey, where's so-and-so? And they'll be like, he's going to be like, I don't know. Wasn't here. That's a sobering reality. Right? Because that second group of people is who Jesus was talking to. That when, they, you know, that when you know, the centurion gets there, he's going to be like, hey, where are all the people following you? He'll be like, Jesus, I don't know. I didn't know him, right? You've heard me use this analogy before. Matthew 7, when Jesus says, um, many will will say on that day, Lord, Lord, and be like, didn't we prophesy in your name? And didn't we cast out demons in your name? And he was like, depart from me, I never knew you. Right? Back in the day, I used to care about the NFL, and I was a Steelers fan. Ben Roethlisberger, you know, Big Ben, he was a quarterback. And uh, it'd be like me going up to Big Ben's house and knocking on the door. (coughs) Excuse me, that one wasn't for effect. It's because I got a frog in my throat. It's like me going up to Ben Roethlisberger's door, knocking on it, and expecting him to invite me in for a barbecue and an iced tea. And be like, hey, Big Ben. He goes, who are you? I'm like, I'm Josh Wallace. What do you mean, who are you? Like, I, uh, I, I had a jersey that I had my name on the back. <laughs> right? I used to wear it every Sunday when I would watch you play. Right? I knew the Steelers' fight song. I know about you. I know you where, you where you went to school. I knew the colors of your college team. Like, I knew all of these things about you, right? I showed up on Sunday. I wore my fancy clothes. I sang the special songs. And I'm standing here going, barbecue. And he goes, beat feet, man. I don't know you. That's what it's going to be like for some, some of these Jews. That they're going to think that just because I'm a part of the covenant people of God, that, that I'm going to just show up and get there. Mm-mm. He goes, there's going to be a lot of people that think they're going to, that she, they should be there. But they're going to be outside in darkness. The Bible says Jesus is light. And he's a light of life. And in him there is no darkness. Okay? Paul in Timothy says that God dwells in unapproachable light. These folks will be thrown outside the camp into darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Okay. In the Greek, there's a definite article before weeping and gnashing. So it's ha weeping and ha gnashing of teeth. I don't know what those Greek words are. What matters here is ha means the. this This is distinct. There will be the weeping and the gnashing of teeth. And gnashing of teeth isn't what I thought it was. I used to picture gnashing of teeth like wolves like on, or like dogs on the end of a chain, snarling like rabid with spit coming down the side of their faces. Gnashing is not snarling and glaring. Gnashing is grinding. So I do this with me. Pretend that you're sobbing. And then grit your teeth, like as hard as you can. Now you're sobbing, like, because you know that there is a banquet going on somewhere that you knew all about, and you had been learning about it your entire life, and you had been hearing that we're going to go there, and then you recognize you're not on the guest list. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are there because of their faith. The same thing that Jesus just praised the centurion for that made him go, wow, was the faith. And there are Jews, people for whom the kingdom was created, outside going, I'm not there, crying. I have wept, like truly wept, a couple of times in my life. One was when my dad died, kind of like Andreas, suddenly. He was alive one minute, 
And then the last time I saw him alive, he was an aphid being carted out of a bar on a stretcher. And I saw that, and I wept because I I didn't know the condition of his soul. I didn't know if he was going to be at the banquet with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I wept. I mean, I cried so many tears, I don't know how my body manufactured them all. And that's what it's like for those who are outside in darkness, weeping, gritting their teeth till they grind down to their gums and they bleed. And I'm being, uh, uh, I'm being emphatic, but not dramatic. It wouldn't be in the text if it weren't true. This is what it's like for those outside. But how do you get in? Faith. How much faith? Enough to save you. Enough to look back at what Jesus did and receive then what he did then for you now. The Bible says faith as small as a mustard seed can move a mountain. But it's recognizing in faith, like the centurion, that Jesus has authority in your life. You don't just get to pray the prayer and then go on living any way you want, as if somehow that accumulates more grace for you. That's what Paul said. Right? The the Bible, I believe, very clearly preaches and teaches lordship salvation. That when you become, uh, when when you admit you're a sinner, you receive the grace that Christ gives you by virtue of his death on the cross, that he then becomes Lord of your life. And because he's Lord, he has decision making authority over your life. It's not a popular thing to say. It's a whole lot easier to come down front, to pray a prayer, to even, I'll even put my hand on you. We'll make it look really good. But if the work isn't done inside your heart that you recognize that Jesus is over you, it doesn't matter. I have, heard of, I have heard of men who have pastored churches, pastored churches, who for 50 years did vocational ministry and then got saved sitting under the, pre, under the teaching of a pastor who had just preached the gospel. These things happen. I don't presume to think that because you grew up in this church or any church, that you sat in Sunday school for your entire life, that the gospel is something that you just received and inherited and heaven is somehow your birthright. It's not. Heaven is not an entitlement. Heaven is not an entitlement. It's not part of our American DNA. We are not, we are not entitled to heaven any more than the Jews are just because they're Jewish. Heaven is not an entitlement. It's a gift. It is a gift. And like any gift that you receive, you didn't pay for it. Someone else did. Someone else paid the price to purchase the gift that was then given to you. And that's what Jesus said salvation is like. Heaven is like. It's like, a, it's like a treasure in a field. That when you find it, you'll give up everything else you have to get it. Because that is worth more than everything that you have in your life at this present moment. That's the kingdom of heaven. That is salvation. It is treasured above all things. You can, that's how you can go through a bad day and have joy on your face because you're not living for today. You're living for eternity. When believers have an eternal perspective and that's how Jesus can say that I'm going to build my rock or my church on this rock and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. You know what that means? I'll march into any single battle because come what may, I know my eternity is secure. You can't stop a church like that. There's no organization on the planet that even compares to what the the promises that God has for His church in Christ. That gift was purchased for you. Jesus paid for it, and we receive it, and we treat it as a precious gift because that's what it is. It cost Him His life. And because it cost Him His life to give me mine, I will serve Him, not out of a sense of obligation, but out of a sense of love. That's obedience. 
The authority that he has in my life, I give him, like I yield to it because I love him and I know that he loves me. And I know that he's not going to ask me to do something that is going to cause, not cause me harm. I mean, people have served and been served Christ to the point of death. I don't hear what I'm not saying. I know that in loving service to Christ, bad things can still happen to me. Here. But the eternal weight of glory outshines any risk I take for Christ on this planet. And you know what? He's not calling. He could. He could call you to go to a mission field in the, you know, whoever knows what islands and preach to a cannibalistic people if they still exist down in the Amazon or something. But what he's calling us to do is walk across the street or... Pray for the server at, at dinner. When you go out to lunch today, ask him, hey, we're getting ready to return thanks for our food and ask God's blessing. Can I pray for you? Simple acts of obedience to let people know who you belong to, whose authority you're under. Right? Doesn't it seem easier to go to the Amazon than to talk to your neighbor? or a stranger, or, man, for me, lately it's been friends that I've known since high school, getting the opportunity to share the gospel. It's, it's wedding season. I'm doing weddings. I got to share the gospel uh, up here uh, a couple weeks ago, a week ago, um, through an ACDC song. You don't think God can redeem all things? Highway to hell led an opportunity for me to preach the gospel. Right? Anything you can do. But that's, what, that's the thing that Christ is calling us to, to obedience in the small things, to be a proclaimer of his word. Right? I'm preaching right now. I was teaching a minute ago. But you guys are all proclaimers. You're all preachers. And you have the best news the world has never heard. See what I did there? It wasn't a slip of the tongue. America, so many people have never heard the truth of the gospel. They, like these these ones who will be thrown into outer darkness with a weeping and gnashing of teeth. We assume that because we're good people, we're going to heaven. I know you don't need to hear that message, but someone else does. Right? That you're not earning your salvation. It's been purchased already. You just receive it. That's what we have to give the world. I don't even have time to finish this out because Jesus says, go. He says, look, it's already been done because you believe that it happened. Now, I don't get a chance to, to pick on the, the, um, the, the word of faith preachers, and I'm going to a little bit. Um, because this is not... All right, so <laughs> I'll get myself into a little bit of trouble. Um, the way Jesus does this, he doesn't... He describes the necessity of faith. Right, so there's description and pre prescription. Prescription is uh, it's the, the thing the doctor writes out to give you, right? If you do this, this will happen. Jesus is, what's happening here is Jesus is, uh, the, Matthew's describing an interaction between Jesus and the centurion. The miracle isn't the point, the faith is the point. The miracle, Jesus does miracles all the time. That didn't surprise him. That didn't amaze him. That didn't make him marvel. It was the faith that the man had. And Jesus says, uh, preachers have been guilty of saying, if you believe it, if you have enough faith, it'll happen. All right? With the leper, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me well. Again, it's an unpopular message. People would rather believe if I just, they would rather think if I believe hard enough, I can make this thing happen. Like somehow I'm declaring or like, like making the Lord do the thing that I want him to do. If there's anyone that had enough faith to make the Lord do something that they wanted to just because they prayed, look at the Apostle Paul. Three times I prayed, remove this thorn in my flesh, this stick in my side. And Jesus said, no, that's not my will. Right? Sometimes the cancer isn't healed. And God is glorified. Okay? I'm not God. I would love to believe that if you just had enough faith, every disease would be gone. I just don't see that. 
either in the Scriptures or in practical life, what I do see is that faith in Jesus' authority to do these things. I'm, look, I'm going to pray for it all day long. I'm praying for Dora, right? I'm praying in faith that God will do these mighty miracles. But if he doesn't, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord is what it says in Job. He's still good. Okay? That's where I want to, that's where I want to leave that, and that's where I want to put that pin. So, wrap this up in 30 seconds. Meg, set your timer. The point of the miracle is to, is to stress Jesus' authority. Okay? Not his blessings, to his, his blessings to his people. Don't set your timer. The point of the miracle is to show Jesus' authority. Not the blessings that he has for his people. Right? It's Christology. Christology is a fancy theological word for um, the study of Christ. The nature and character of who he is. Right? This is Christology that we're talking about in this miracle, not therapy. Right? <clears throat> he can, Jesus can make us physically better. But that is only a signpost pointing to who he really is. Okay? The miracles testify to who he is. And he's more than a miracle worker. Okay? He is a miracle worker, but he's more. He is a savior. He is a redeemer. He's going to be a judge. Okay? If today, like I'm sure there's people in here that are praying for miracles, that you want miracles. But I'm telling you that if you want a miracle more than you want salvation, you don't understand salvation and what he did for you on the cross. Because the first miracle that gets done in any person's life, or the greatest miracle that gets done in any person's life, is to be a dead man walking, dying in your sins, and then being raised to new life with Jesus Christ. That's the thing I want you to know this morning. That the miracle is only a signpost to the miracle worker. And the miracle worker is more than that. He is the Savior of the world. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. <sighs> Heavenly Father, thank you so much for... Clarity of thought. I don't ever want anything I say or do up here to be, to take anything away from who you are. And God, what I say up here, I want to make sure it encapsulates you perfectly. I don't want to lead anyone to anything other than the Christ through preaching the gospel. So God, I pray that as you're working in the, the hearts of, of men and women inside here and those watching online, God, that if they would be moved and bold enough to respond in faith. They can receive the forgiveness that you've purchased for them. But God, it's not enough inwardly to just receive it. God, that they would be, that they would be bold enough to let us know so they can be welcomed into the family of God. And they can be discipled like these ones here that Jesus spoke to. Because you've given us salvation individually and the church corporately. That this would be the, the means by which your kingdom would spread on earth until you come for us. God, thank you for the work you're doing and the work you'll continue to do. And thank you for the example of great faith through someone who didn't belong just like me. But because of your great love, You've welcomed us in. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.